voice is such an enormous part of his character and who he is. How early did you become involved in the process? I got involved with Wally three years before the film was completed. And, and that's a, you know, a really uh, great lead time. You, know, you don't often get that kind of opportunity in sound design uh, to develop something. Usually you're working just in a few weeks at the very end of the process rushing to get something done. But um, Pixar and, and Andrew Stanton knew that they needed to develop some very special sounds for the characters in the movie, so they needed to work on it and, and, and actually establish it. Uh, they had the confidence that it would work before they'd move ahead and really do the whole production. Now, there's a lot of found sounds that have been used in the creation of Wally. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk to me a little bit about, for both Wally and the many other sounds in the in the film? I created um, about 2,600 sound files for Wally, which is a lot more than any normal feature film. Usually uh, a Star Wars film might require about 1,000 sound files, and uh, an Indiana Jones film maybe seven or 800, and that's, those are a lot unto themselves. Um, but Wally had, needed to have a whole world. I mean, everything in the film from a sound standpoint uh, is fabricated. You have to find a sound for every bit of wind, every door that opens and closes, every vehicle or weapon, or a uh, bit of mechanical activity of a robot. So um, most of that activity is, uh, starts with going out into the world around us with a, with a recording device and collecting sounds, and I love doing that. Sometimes you just wander across the street between uh, buildings at Pixar and record the gates opening and closing and squeaky doors and things, and you find later that becomes a great sound for a robot. Uh, or I go to uh, the shopping center and record shopping carts. We needed to crash shopping carts together for a brief scene in the movie. I took my daughter to the store to act as a cover, and we put the recorder in the cart and crashed into things. Um, to get those sounds. Um, so a lot of it is just gathering sounds in a documentary style and then bringing them back in the studio and pulling that little kernel, that little piece out of the sound which is going to fit something in the movie. Do you find yourself, I mean the world is obviously one big sound file to you, do you spend <laughs> your time gathering sounds even without a project in mind if you hear something interesting, do you grab it? I, I've learned that the world is a big sound file and that if I'm not prepared to just collect things uh, all the time that I will miss opportunities because a lot of the best sounds have been found by accident. I just hear something and run over and get it. And yes, um, a week doesn't go by or a trip doesn't go by that I haven't uh, gone out to record something. And uh, even on this press junket I've been recording things. There was a great squeaky door at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris and I got it. So someday if we need that squeaky door in a movie, I'll have it. So are your family and friends constantly being used as a source of sound themselves? My family gets involved because they're around me. If someone's got a bad cough or funny breathing, I'll probably record it. Or if they uh, are doing something interesting with sound, I, I, I would do it. Friends would call up and say, I've got a broken ceiling fan. It's making a funny squeak. Would you like to come over and record it? Usually I say yes, because it will be useful someday. How do you inject heart into a robotic machine? Uh, I think, uh, you know, when a character is being developed, um, I will, uh, of course, listen uh, to the director to, you know, he'll usually have a pretty apt description about what he's looking for, or give me a capsule description of the character and what its emotional frame of reference is. Um, also, artwork will tell a lot because the Pixar characters are you know, there's a very tremendous amount of creativity that goes into the design of something. It's not just haphazard in, in any, any, any way. And that, I will, I will try to be inspired by what they're doing. Um, on Wally, what we did was um, I would go into the studio and make sounds as an audition based on maybe just a sketch of the character, a verbal sketch. Um, and we took those sounds and gave them to animators and they did tests and they actually animated little simple actions with those sounds as the basis. So, you know, it might be Wally driving in and playing with a ball and driving out again, something like that. But by doing those experiments, everybody participated in the character development. Um, they could listen to the sounds and be inspired by what I was doing. I could see their capabilities right away and, you know, oh my gosh, look, look, look what they can do in communicating an emotion by just the pose of Wally's head. 
um, a stance or something like that. And so we went back and forth over a long period of time developing characters with both visually and with their sounds at the same time. And out of that, it's a, it's a, that collaboration, everybody ends up contributing to the character uh, in some way and it builds up the depth of character. It's consistent. Now you've developed some of the most iconic characters in cinematic history. Mm -hmm. Is there any that you have a particular attachment to? There are many characters I've been connected with that, of course, I have a fondness for. R2-D2, uh, of course, because that was the first robot that I, and it was a big challenge for me. I didn't have any guide to go by. There weren't any previous cinema robots that acted that way, so uh, getting R2 to work and be understandable by the public was, was very satisfying. And that opened the door to the development of you know, other aliens and other characters along the way. Um, lots of times I just, I, I really love simple characters that come and go briefly in scenes. Um, you know, there's the vacuum bot in Wally. I, even though he's only there for a few moments here and there, that's, he could have had a much bigger part. It's a good sound. Um, you know, you just take a vacuum cleaner and then do a little bit of <laughs> with the vacuum going and there you go. Uh, there's some robots and characters. There was one called uh, uh, Watt Tambor, who had a minor part in uh, one of the last Star Wars movies. He was a robot whose voice couldn't stay the same pitch, and it would go up and down by accident. You'd have to keep readjusting it with a little dial. That was a fun character. Not, not memorable to the public, but those things are very satisfying to a sound designer because there requires an inventiveness. And of course, we're all entertainment, entertainers at heart and we love to entertain an audience, and a sound designer is no different than that. You love to be able to do some kind of performance with sound and get an audience reaction, hopefully the reaction you're shooting for. And, uh, and so, you know, Wally was lo loaded with characters and challenges like that, and they, they, they all worked out very well. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Absolute you're welcome. pleasure to meet you.